Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Mark Burns, and I uh, want to thank the center, Dr. Robbins, Dr. Schaefer, Annie, Becky. It's, it's truly, truly special to be here, a huge honor. The city of Tucson has something, as Dr. Schaefer said, truly special here in this center. It's uh, as me as a photographer all my life to come here and go through and see what, what is in the back rooms of this building is just uh, spectacular, so truly amazing. I'm gonna, we're going to do a video real quick that I think will give you a little foundation of the project I did, then I'll talk to you some about that project. For me, it was what kind of brought it together. As a photographer, I wanted to go out as a visual artist and do something at the 100 year anniversary. And I knew quickly it had to be in black and white for me. Gene Becker, President Bush's Chief of Staff, and I had dinner in Houston, and um, she asked if I had any ideas, and I had been reading, um, at that time, the Ken Burns, Dayton Duncan series, America's, uh, the National Parks, America's Best Idea, and so I was kind of watching that, and I started doing some research, and knew that the 100-year anniversary was 2016, and at that time, this was about, you know, six years down the road. You know, it just kind of struck me, being a photographer, that, um, you know, I could go out, and in black and white, which is my medium that I love to work in, photograph these parks at the 100 year anniversary. And black and white being for me that timeless bridge back to the past century so that when you look at the photographs, even though they're done in 2013, 2014, 2015, um, the you know, land hasn't changed. It still looks like the photographs you look at from the you know, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, and the, you know the National Park Service has indeed protected the the, the uh, these spots as they intended. To my understanding, from what I've been told, it's the only collection now of all 59 national parks photographed by one photographer in black and white that exists. So, uh, five-year project. Um, it was. Uh, an undertaking, an undertaking in the beginning, I think, I looked at it as you just saw there, I, I had about six years to, to, the, to the anniversary date. Looking at the U.S. map, looking at the parks, yeah, I think I can do that. And uh, it ended up being really difficult to photograph 59 parks in five years. When you're trying to get one iconic shot from each park in black and white, I think the black and white made it a little, it definitely made it more difficult because you, kind of have to look for a little extra something there, I think, to get a shot that really kind of grabs the viewer. Um, I want to pull up a, a photograph here and show you where, kind of where the starting point was for the project. Uh, let's see, how do we get to the, where the photos are? There we go. All right. This this is from one of the very first trips during the project. This is in Yosemite, and I've got a 4x5 field camera there. So that was kind of my ideal starting off, was I'm going to go out with black and white 4x5 film, my 4x5 field camera, and do this project. <clears throat> so I wanted to be very, very traditional, was my mindset at that time, uh, to kind of do it like Mr. Adams would have done it, or did it, had to do it at that time. Um, what happened with this, process was the workflow just didn't, wasn't fast enough for me to, to complete all 59 parks in five years. So I started doing some roll film backs on this 4x5 camera, which would speed up the process, but then found still after coming back from trips that may have been, the trips may have been three weeks long and 8,000 miles of driving. And you come back and you develop all the film and you you, you see some good stuff, but you also see something that you want to go back there and, and be able to redo that. And it's not easy. You have to plan another trip three or four months down the road to, to get into a loop where you're going to go back over that area to reshoot it. So the workflow really became what dictated the project, you know, toward the last three or four years. And with that said, I ended up switching over to some digital equipment that was some medium format digital first that was about 40 megapixels. and allowed me to get some really good quality. Um, and then later in the project, when, uh, when some of the DSLR cameras came out in the 36 megapixel range, those ended up working very well to get some, some very good quality. So workflow really kind of dictated me being able to photograph all those parks in that time frame. 
So I'll show you a few of the photographs that we, I brought today just to give you an idea. Let's see. This is This is uh, kind of how the project ended, the other extreme. Um, this is with the, with the DSLR camera in Grand Teton. Craig Robbins, right over here, took this photo. He was with me. And so you see the extremes there. Starting off with the 4 by 5 ideal, I'm going to go out and do it that way, and ending up at the end of the project with a DSLR camera shooting digitally and then um, working from the digital files. I also did some shooting on film with roll film or 4x5 from this camera that I scanned and got some files that way also. So that was another workflow that I tried to incorporate into it. Let's see. All right, here's some park images. Um, this is one that I like a lot. I'm not sure that it shows up quite as well on this uh, in the lighting conditions in here because there's some real fine light rays coming in from the, the sun. But this was an interesting photograph. This was one of the first ones that I did. And actually, the scene that I was in this park shooting, this is White Sands National Monument. This was a, actually, this is a national monument. It was the test photograph that I did to present to an advisory committee that I had who were, we were working to do some fundraising for the project. And this was one of the very first images that I went out and shot in White Sands National Monument because it was close, relatively close to Houston. It was a, offered a good place to do the photography and bring back some interesting photographs. But what was really interesting about this is people talk a lot about, you know, do you go out and shoot 20,000 photographs on your two or three week trip and you come back and you pick, you know, one or two out that may be the best shots and it's not that way at all. I'm working very statically with cameras like this that I started off with in the beginning or if I was shooting digital, I'm still working exactly like I would work with this camera or this camera. So your <laughs> tripod, very static, uh, cable, electronic cable release with the digital. So it's the same exact process as if I were working with one of these cameras that I'm using shooting the scene if I'm using a digital camera. And the, uh, the goal I had every day was to be in the field one hour before sunrise. So you're you're set up at your primary spot where you want to start. The sky starts to lighten, and you're there to capture, hopefully, you know, a great photograph. But this shot was interesting because actually what I was shooting was a yucca plant that was right over there. <laughs> and as I was waiting for the light to get right on the yucca plant, this huge storm was stacking up behind me, coming across the sky. And I keep looking, going, wow, that's getting really good and then it got better and then it got where okay I'm turning everything around and I turned it around and forgot about the yucca plant and I'm looking at this now well at that moment this mountain range was still brightly lit up in sunshine but the clouds were forming and were really really nice and as I had the camera pointed this way for for maybe 60 seconds the the shadow the mountains went into shadow like this this was not dodged or burned or photoshopped this way it was this is what happened, just the way the light was coming through the clouds that went in the shadow, and I got that shot. And there's actually some really nice light rays coming in from the clouds, too, that you see. But, so that was an example of something, a scene that lasted maybe 60 seconds. Day. But it's really a captured moments. A lot of it, we're, we're waiting for hours for 60 seconds to happen. All right, this, this is uh, winter solstice moon at Grand Canyon. This was taken just about two months ago on December 21st. And this photograph I started planning about five months ago. I, I uh, frequently look online at the US Naval Observatory website. They have great data for any sun, moon, times, angles, attitudes, everything you can think of. So I could see, you know, what time the moon was rising and what time the sun was setting. And I looked for, the, looked for those windows or months when you have a sunset just about five minutes before the moonrise happens so that you have this event occurring and you still have light from the, from the sunset that is illuminating, kind of putting a glow on the, 
foreground or on the land and then you have the, the sky is deep enough and the moon's at an angle where it's right over the horizon like that so you can get a shot like this. So this was a lot of planning. On this particular day, I woke up in the morning and all these clouds here, it was very solidly overcast all day long. This was about 5.20, 5.25 in the evening when we took this photo and until about 4.30, it was, this, this area was all clouded over. So it was one of the things that I dealt with frequently during the project was you, make, you do all the planning, but then you have Mother Nature and the weather that you have to, you know, hope cooperates. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. This was, was probably, I think Craig was with me, uh, Craig Robbins here was with me and I think was one of the most beautiful moonrises I've seen in many, many years. It just, the clouds moved off to the southeast, the moon came up and it happened. So got lucky on that one. Direction. Do what? What direction is the moon? It's to the east, yeah. Okay, this is uh, <coughs> this is Old Faithful and Old Faithful in uh, Yellowstone National Park, and this was a photograph that I thought would be relatively easy to take because Old Faithful is on a very regular schedule. You go to the visitor center, they have a, a little clock face there that says next eruption in 90 minutes or 85 minutes or over it may be and you can kind of, you know, people go out there and wait around the boardwalk and the eruption happens within about 15 minutes of when it's supposed to. So I thought that would be relatively easy and I was very, very wrong. Uh, <laughs> this, I, I spent a week trying to get this photo of getting up every morning about 3 a.m leaving a cabin and driving up to Old Faithful and um, being there again just before sunrise, trying to get the first eru eruption of the, the, the morning when there was enough light to capture it. Um, and what happens is the, the, the steam vapors are very, very hot, obviously, and they're in cold air. And if there's any wind currents at all, it just blows it all directions. And it looks like a gray cloud, the whole, I had fo many photos where the whole photograph looked just like a gray, washed out cloud. You could really not even see any definition at all, Harley, of the water coming up. So after, after one week of attempts, uh, finally on the last morning, it was totally calm. It was uh, not quite as cold, which may have helped. And it came up and did this nice little kind of curl over on the right, which I really like the way that worked out, but that was, that was a shot that I thought would be very easy and ended up taking a week of being there to get that. Okay, this is, uh, this is called Schwabacher's Landing in Grand Teton National Park, and this, um, this to me was a very kind of a classic western landscape photograph that uh, what the, the fog you see in the back is a really thick fog bank that was laying right over the Snake River is what that is and I, I really, I, you know, I like what it did to the photo. It kind of added a, something kind of unusual in there but that's a fog bank over the Snake River. Right down here, this was a little a beaver home and about 30 minutes before I took this photo there was a the beaver was working busily swimming back and forth down here and I was hoping that he would cooperate and maybe be in the picture but he wasn't. But uh, this was you know to me just a kind of a classic western landscape kind of a scene. The, some nice angular clouds kind of worked their way in which I liked a lot. I think it added something to it. It kind of replicates the kind of the shapes of the mountains up there. And then the next shot which is also Grand Tetons. This is on a different trip. This was a late winter storm, I think in late April, that uh, came blowing in there one, one morning about nine o'clock. And just a totally different look. So this is a kind of an example, I think, more of trying to photograph the atmosphere and the weather much more than the geology or the, or the, the mountain. And um, I like this one a lot. This is actually my favorite of the two, I think. This prints upstairs if you happen to get to go up there and take a look at them. All right. This is, uh, I don't know if you could call this a landscape, but this is at Dry Tortugas National Park um, off about 60, 70 miles off the coast of Key West, Florida. 
And it's very unusual. It's a little island that sits out there in the, in the, um, in the Gulf. And it's the largest, I think, the largest brick structure in the northern hemisphere. It was built uh, before the Civil War and uh, was very interesting to place to visit and kind of walk through and, and see the, the massive scale of it. This is just one, about half of one of the corridors. And I thought it, it you know, looking at it as a black and white photographer, you just see all these, these tones and the white plaster there to the right and down on the bottom really kind of worked for me. And the little, that's, a, that's an open air window out the, on the very back end that goes out over the water that you would, could look through in the back. But, so this was a, you know, a shot that just kind of as a photographer, you see the composition, you see all the tonality at play, and you say, I need to, need to make a picture of that. So that's kind of what that was. What was the other, um, it was a, a, an army base, military base. It was also, a, they had a prison there. I think Dr. Samuel Mudd from the Lincoln conspiracy was in prison there for a number of years. Um, but it was, it's been a military base during the Civil War, I believe. Um, and I think afterwards, maybe it, it still was connected with the military in some way. And then here's another one of the same. This is the outside of the building. So that shot, you were inside one of these corridors looking down the corridor. This is a shot from the outside. And I wanted to show this one because this was uh, an example of, of looking at the scene. This is, a, this is a moat that they have around the fort. So there's sand. The, the, the ocean is right out about 50 yards to the, to the side. You can see the ocean in the very back. And you can see the little sand, uh, you know, the land of the sand coming out. So that there's a sand ring around it with the moat right around the brick, all the way around the fort, and then the ocean outside that. And it's a very small island. Really, the island is pretty much the fort. Uh, but this was an example of, I looked at this, and this was water in the moat that was just kind of rippling. And the sky was kind of slowly moving across the clouds. And this was putting on, uh, stacking on several neutral, dark neutral density filters and doing about a, probably about a two minute exposure because the bricks weren't going anywhere. They're solid as a rock, obviously, and they're gonna stay right there. So it allowed the, the water to get this glassy look because it's about a two minute exposure and it, it allowed the clouds to even kind of blur and move as they move through there. So this was kind of, fun for me just to kind of stack the neutral density filters and see what you can do uh, with that kind of putting that technique to work of softening the, the motion. This uh, is the Grand Canyon, obviously, and this is called, this is from a viewpoint called the Abyss, and I think it's uh, aptly named as you kind of look into this huge, huge area of the canyon. And this was a day, um, the, next, the next morning, they had a lot of snow there, a white out snowstorm, kind of similar to what it was like yesterday morning here, um, <laughs> which I didn't expect. But anyway, this winter storm was coming in and this was the storm just as it was starting to come in and the sky was doing amazing things. And I liked the way the, the way the, the angles worked. The water was reflecting right off of the sky, giving you that kind of nice illuminated river there, the Colorado River. So that's a photograph I, I like a lot and printed this with a little bit of a sepia tone to it as I kind of replicate here in the digital file. But um, I like skies like that. I like when you have the light coming in and like when you have a lot going on with the clouds. This, is, uh, this was not one of the National Park Project photos, but it was taken during the project as I was driving past the Horseshoe Bend National Recreational Area. And this is the Colorado River just outside the Grand Canyon. But it's a photograph that I also really liked. And one thing that I point out about this that I like is the backlighting. The, the, the sun was right above where that frame cuts off there. And backlighting, I think, can be really dramatic at the way it works on the rocks there to the left and along the river on the left and then kind of glances off the rocks you see on the center and the both sides there. So 
backlighting is something you have to really learn to control, but um, when, it, when it works, it can be very effective in kind of increasing the kind of the grip and feel of the photograph, I think. It um, is one of the things I really like about this photo. And then I want to show you this. This is a, a photograph that I did in Alaska with Secretary of Interior Sally Jewell that we presented to her in the Department of the Interior in 2015. And uh, this, this, is a, this Topeka Glacier is the name of this photo, and it, it clearly shows the glacier. It's hard to see here, but the glacier has receded about 200 yards up from the water. Uh, so what was formerly a tidewater glacier is now up, and you have the moraine coming down between the, the end of the ice now and, the, and the, the water. And we were talking about environmental issues and she was really, a, we had a wonderful chat for about an hour and talked about the photography and she really kind of reinstilled in me the power of photography and protecting the environment. And um, you know, after working five years on a project like this, it was really nice to have someone in her position to talk to you and kind of reinforce what you had done. So, that was real special to present that to her. Were you on a moving boat when you did that? We were, yeah. I was on it. That was one of the few um, one of the few times that I was not using a uh, tripod was in Alaska, either on an airplane when we I photographed um, Wrangell St. Elias from a from an airplane, and that was the only way you could really show massive amounts of um, scale there. I mean, these glaciers are 20, 30 miles long, some of them, and you couldn't get that from the ground, but you could get it from an airplane. So boats and airplanes were the only exception from working like this from tripods were when I was in Alaska. This is something I wanted to show. It's kind of fun for me. I've, uh, I've always loved bikes and cycling, and, uh, and when you get to the parks, they're so crowded now, oftentimes, that you, you can't move your vehicle around a lot. So I bought this Trek transport bike and I can, I've got two of these pannier bags. I know Ansel had a mule, but <laughs> I have a bicycle. So I can't go up in the back country, but I can certainly park my vehicle at one spot and I can actually put the eight by 10 camera or the four by five or the six by 17 or the digital gear in these pannier bags that I have hard cases that fit in there and on that top uh, on the flat part of the top on the back there, I can strap on most any tripod I have. So this has been a great way visiting the parks to park your vehicle at one spot when you get there an hour before sunrise and they're empty. And then you can pull the bike out and ride to spots a mile or two up and down and get to different overlooks. And as soon as I got that, a friend of mine who's uh, also really into cycling said, well, how much does it weigh with all that camera gear? And I said, well, it, weighs a whole lot. And they said, well, what do you do going uphill? And I said, I just get off and push it. <laughs> it's a lot easier than carrying it all. So anyway, I didn't show this yesterday, but it was something that really, um, you know, I'm using more and more trying to, it's got to be the right park to work from to, to make it work, but it can be a very, very effective way to, to uh, move around these days in a park. So Becky, are we going to talk now? Why don't you take the middle chair? Okay. 